the world today. My name is Steve Sprague, and I'll be your moderator as well as your speaker for today's session on Latin America and SAP ERP, five common issues that we see within implementation and ongoing change management. A little bit of housekeeping before we get into this. We are utilizing the Citrix GoToWebinar solution. There will be an ability to ask questions at any point in time during the presentation within your console. You'll see areas there. I'll look to address those during the presentation, but more importantly, at the end from a Q&A perspective. I'm going to try to keep this down to 40 minutes. That's a lot of material. We're going to cover some of the new legislation, or at least the legislation you should be aware about, that uh, takes place here towards the December time frame, as well as what we're seeing into 2015. And then we're going to look at how Latin America and the constantly changing and complex tax and the invoicing legislation really affects a global template of an ERP system, uh, specifically SAP. And so let's jump right into it. Again, from an agenda perspective, we're going to look at some of the, the government updates for those that might not be aware or here for the first time from a learning perspective. We're going to look at the common SAP issues in Latin America that this legislation causes, and then we'll look at the Q&A at the end. And so a little bit of background uh, on our organization. Uh, leading organizations work with us. We primarily work with Fortune 2000 organizations that run SAP and have operations in multiple countries. Uh, we do support Brazil, all of the Nota Fiscal, SPED reporting, Miro Amigo, uh, inbound transportation known as CTE, as well as eSocial, which I'll talk about here in a second. Mexico, full support of CFDI, uh, as well as Miro Amigo uh, in SAP speak. This is three-way match in accounts payables, uh, along with Nomina Electronica. Argentina fully support the AFIP integration. Chile uh, have expanded there with full support of DTE and Libros reporting. DTE is their uh, acronym for their electronic invoicing. And we've just added Ecuador. We're also adding three more countries towards Q1 of 2015. We're what we call SAP hybrid cloud deployment, which means really two things from a, a value perspective to an end user. The first is your business users work inside of SAP. The monitors in SAP, their daily activities are inside of SAP. They don't have to log out and go to multiple systems, integration brokers, to try to figure out where this invoice is. Because remember, in Latin America, it's as much of an operational and shipping issue as it is an electronic invoicing issue. More importantly, this hybrid cloud strategy allows us to buffer the SAP global template from the constant change and configurations that this legislation often creates. You know, as example, we have customers that still run 4.6C, but they're fully compliant with the latest Brazilian legislation. They're fully compliant with the Mexico legislation. And so that's a huge advantage, not to have your corporate template of your ERP system driven by constantly changing mandates, which is a trend and a reality for Latin America. Production support, there for day-to-day -day phone calls, English, Spanish, and of course Portuguese, and it's end-to-end, -end, you know, whether that's an SAP trigger point issue, IDOC issue, uh, government connectivity issue were there from a support perspective. And then most importantly, the change management. Keeping up with this legislation, you know, currently we're going through the 3.1 upgrades with our customer base. Those are at no additional cost. Those are included as part of the managed service that we provide versus many companies out there that are looking at additional statements of work, systems integrators, SAP ERP upgrades, upgrades to middlewares. This concept of one platform embedded in SAP that eliminates the constant configuration, eliminates the support issues, but more importantly turns the constant chaos into a fixed and predictable cost is, is really why companies do business with us. Now, for those that might be new to the Latin American e-factura, e e-invoicing, nota fiscal type space, it's important to understand it's the most complex in the world, and it's different from anywhere in the world. It's nothing like the EU. I've had a lot of questions over the past few weeks on what's going on in Italy, what's going on in Spain, is that similar? Not even close. Uh, Europe is looking at business to government solely. When you look at Latin America, it is every business to business transaction that goes on inside of the country. If you look at a country like Brazil from its sophistication, it has filings for imports, filings for exports, filings for freight payables and transportation documents. It's every inbound good, outbound good, services, um, 
need to be uh, integrated at the city level. It's extremely complex and constantly changing. These things are tied to reports. And so it's important to understand that that complexity is mandated. Uh, these countries do more invoices in e-invoices than all of Europe combined. Uh, for example, Brazil does more electronic invoices than the majority of Europe combined. If you take a look at a study that came out where there were approximately 27 billion electronic invoices and you took Brazil and Mexico, it was approximately 17 billion of those 27, just those two countries. So we're talking about a completely different environment where the government forces the XML. It's typically tied to logistics. For example, in Brazil and in Chile, you cannot ship if that invoice is not on the truck. Chile also has a bill of lading called a despacho that will allow you to do that. But a document that's approved by the government needs to go on the truck in these countries. In Argentina, if you export, the document must go with the truck. So it's as much as an outbound logistics issue as it is an inbound receiving issue. Uh, one of the big things people are concerned about now are the general ledger, journal, and accounting reports that will be due in January in Mexico. These are self-audits. Uh, there were some recent articles here uh, in a magazine called BN Americas that talked about the amount of money that the Mexico government is making uh, off of their audits now. So for every um, dollar they're investing in audits, they're returning almost $5 in whether you want to call it profits or uh, tax increases or, or, or gaining there, it's, it's a huge amount of money. In 2011, Brazil, for example, because of the reporting in Nota Fiscal, you know, they increased their, their government intake by almost 109 billion riai. It's a huge amount of money for these countries uh, in closing down the tax leakage. So it's mandated, it's extremely complex, it's integrated into business processes, and it's constantly changing. And so if we look at Brazil, which is by far the most complicated country, some things that you really want to be aware of are uh, a couple. First, this concept of CTE, these are transportation invoices. And so if you're paying freight charges, if you're getting the bill from a third-party logistics company, you need to be collecting the CTE XML, you need to be validating it, and you need to be storing it at a minimum. Whenever we talk about inbound in these countries, there's a minimum requirement of collection, validation, and archiving, but there's also driving business process off of it. You know, for example, we'll actually do freight payables matching uh, inside of the SAP system, but you're kind of like a Miro Amigo for freight payables. But that's often overlooked. Sometimes these documents are not even collected, and so ensure that CTE uh, is there. MDF is more for companies that have their own trucks and utilize contractors. We have customers that own their own trucks and uh, pay contractors to drive them or employees. MDF will need to accompany that truck. That's been going on through June, October is another deadline set for this MDF, uh, this manifest, but important. The big one that everyone is concerned about is 3.1. It's due in December. It's a new schema change. There's really three things you need to be aware about with uh, 3.1. The first is it's a new schema, uh, a new requirement, has new information. A lot of stuff around import, importation on how goods get into the country. Uh, also a lot of manipulation to make it actually easier for the government to audit you in this 3.1 version. The servers, uh, the test servers have been live for a while, what we call the home legation environments, but you must transition by December. It's a, a large project for a lot of people. Our average upgrades are under three weeks with our customers, some of them taking five to seven days with our business model. But you know, I've heard companies take three, four months. I've talked to many companies that have tried to upgrade and have actually failed at this point in time. And so it's a good opportunity to look at potentially better solution approaches. And you know, one of the things that I can tell you about 3.1 is they took some of the teeth out of the legislation around this concept of, of, of taxation, uh, a couple areas, and I guarantee you there will be 3.2 at some point in time because the government systems are set up to absorb it. All those requirements they made optional, but those will become mandatory, so we expect further changes just based on the current legislation. But this is the big one. It affects the outbound processing. Service invoices have always been mandated. Most companies do this manually. You can actually automate this throughout the majority of Brazil. For example, we connect to 120 cities and maintain those connections uh, at Invoiceware. The destinatario, this is actually an interesting process and will continue to come down the line. So if you're in oil and gas, you should be doing this um, at this point in time. But 
the destinatario is a concept of really multiple messages back to the government. So from the perspective of when you receive a note of a scale from a domestic supplier, you'll have to tell the government, one, that you expected to receive that, and then two, you'll have to confirm the operation, which is basically if I ordered 100 widgets, I have to tell the government I got 100 widgets. Or if I only received 90 of the 100, I have to tell them I received 90 of the 100, and 10 were damaged in transit, which is why I sent them back. Now, interestingly enough, this is now expanding into states. So the, the most southern states, and Rio Grande del Sul is one of the very important ones because this is really the home of a lot of the Nota Fiscal technical requirements and development. And also, Santa Catarina, which is just north, if you are doing business, you are a tax ID in these states, and you are receiving invoices over 100,000 rei, then you have to do destinatario. Everyone's waiting for Sao Paulo to drop on this. And it has a, a, a lot of implications because it's not just about invoicing, it's also utilized to, to help track black market goods is one of the, the, the issues there. So destinatario will continue to come into play uh, for organizations. You can actually do it voluntarily. You can move into destinatario. You have the advantage that you can download your supplier's XML from the government portals uh, or the government servers so that if you're missing the XML, you can always go get them from the government rather than having them sent to you by the supplier. Now, there's limitations on this if you do it voluntarily, but something to keep track of. E-social was a huge concern. Um, it actually has moved from June-October mandates in 2014. Now to the point, the latest release of the SAFAS um, about a month ago stated that once they release the final schemas, they're updating some of the servers and components. Once they release the final schemas of eSocial, you will have six months to be live with the system. Again, we fully support uh, eSocial at Invoiceware. We have a cloud solution to, to make it easier to, to integrate and, and manage because there's usually multiple back-end systems, uh, or even some systems don't exist, and so you do need some manual entry to it. I would expect eSocial either to be announced in January or June of next year. But again, the mandates had existed for 2014. They bumped those back primarily because of concerns of getting everyone transitioned to 3.1 on the good side. But this is coming. It's large. It's 40 transactions per employee. If someone gets sick, you tell the government. If you hire someone, you tell the government. Payroll goes through this process. And so a lot of things constantly going on in Brazil. Uh, again, eSocial is labor events and payroll events. The payroll events uh, are more on a monthly basis, um, very similar to what Mexico is doing with their Nomino Electronica when they did the complemento and signing of the, the payroll receipts in Mexico. What's different is the labor events, and this is what is uh, more real-time. You know, there have been studies that the SAFAS is looking at increasing tax intake based on penalties and issues, you know, close to 30 billion RI with this. It's a very, very complicated environment, a very, very intricate environment, and it's something that you must be aware of if you run your own HR and payroll software. So often if you have a BPO environment, we have customers that have BPO, they will uh, actually take care of this process for you. We have other customers that utilize solutions like ADP or Metaphor, uh, and you know, the question will be, do they support that or do they use our solutions in combination with it? Um, or if you're running like an SAP HR or PeopleSoft, then you definitely need a solution. So if you are running HR payroll services for Brazil internally, software products, you will need a solution. Mexico, a couple things that are, that are interesting here. I've always talked about a single pack strategy being an issue because unlike Brazil, Chile, or in Argentina, there's no contingency. There's no fallback paper process. And while the law states that you can ship your goods with a car to Porto, which is a third-party logistics invoice, many customers want that e-factura on the truck. Uh, and so that, that is an issue. And so it, technically the, the rule of the law says you can ship with a, a number of different documents. We have many customers that put the CFDI the acronym for the, the invoice on the truck. And so we always recommend a multi-pack strategy because these packs have been overwhelmed. You know, they could have 40, 50, 100,000 customers and, and do only a few million dollars a year in revenue. And so it's difficult for them to maintain business, which is why you see the majority of the large packs looking at supply chain finance, additional business. It's just not sustainable. Um, additionally, you're seeing some of the telcos look at getting into this um, 
PAC signing business as well, and the SAT continues to provide services. So they have released a free portal to do CFDI. You know, they've talked about the tax mailboxes and some of the mobile apps that they're looking to do to do uh, eFactura. And so we do think the SAT will take over more and more control of this. Now, the one question I always get is this concept on the accounting books, eBooks. You know, there have been VAT reports based on your purchases uh, in, in the past, but this is really very much like SPED. It's journal entries, accounting books, general ledger type information done on a monthly basis retroactively. You know, we get questions a lot of will we have a solution. Uh, and we are moving in the direction of, of, of doing that. We're still in some evaluations of, of where SAP will go with that. But a couple key things. Normally in reporting, you need to look at three things. Extract, signing, automated web service. At this point in time, Mexico is nothing but an XML extract. There's a defined format. You can go to the Mexico website. You can see that. Uh, and so it's really an extract issue because there is no signature required on that document as of yet. There's no complemento like they did with Nomina, the payroll. However, um, they don't have a web service either. You must go to your tax mailbox at the SAT, utilize your, your tax ID, et cetera, to log in and upload it there on a monthly basis. And so that's important. Now, again, you know, I talked about some reports of the Mexico government increasing their take on the audits and fines, and this is why these governments do it. I mean, they do it to get uh, their tax leakage. And so this accounting books is, is what every other government has done. When you look at Chile with Libros, when you look at Brazil with SPED, you're basically self-auditing yourself on a transaction basis. And when you think about the retention tax in the CFDI XML, the concept of withholding, you know, in these countries that are VAT-based, what they're going after is, are you paying your VAT remittances correctly? Because this is where the fines are coming. I've spoken to organizations that are doing all the inbound processing manual, collecting XML, they're typically not matching it, they go into some email server or some other archive and they're paying off of paper invoices. And this is just an audit risk waiting to happen because the government is fining that. That's what they're utilizing to trigger their fines. The one company I spoke with, four XML messages, 100,000 US dollar fine for four XML messages. Now they were doing 10,000 inbound XML a month. What if you're doing 20,000 inbound XML a month? What if you're doing, or 10,000 a year? What if you're doing 20,000 a month? What if you're doing 40,000 a month? You know, what if you're even doing 500 a month and they're large invoices and something screws up in the process and it doesn't work? The fine is 55% of the tax value. And so this is critical, and the accounting books are just another way to ensure that they're gathering their money. And when you talk about the billions of pesos that they're getting from the CFDI process, it's going to increase. There's still this concept of customer addenda. The Mexico organizations have, uh, or at least the schema is open. It has this flexibility, which is what the government calls flexibility. It tends to create a headache for organizations. So there's a there's gaps in the Mexico XML. For example, there's no purchase order number in the Mexico XML called the Copramante. They just didn't care about it. So they have a section called Addenda where a big buyer or a customer can say, I want you to add this information. Like Walmart forces you to, to put an EDI uh, transaction in there and send it over AS2. But requesting things like purchase order number, location, maybe something from a shipping perspective. You've got companies like Sorliana, one of the big retailers, and even Pepsi uh, is doing this, whereby what they're doing in Mexico is you send them the XML, you send them your truck, they'll trigger a goods receipt number, they'll send you the goods receipt number, you got to put it into the addenda after the fact, and then resend them the document, and only then will they pay it. Uh, this addenda after the fact process. We have solutions for that within SAP as well, but they're getting more complicated because of gaps in the government XML. Buyers are getting very creative with this addenda concept, and we have customers with 30, 40, 50 addenda. Uh, Nomina, again, from a payroll perspective. Chile is mandated. Uh, any company over what they call 100,000 Unidad Formados, uh, it's basically an inflationary currency, um, translates into approximately 4.2 million US dollars a year. So if you have a Chile operation doing more than 4.2 million, you a year in revenue in country, you have to go electronic. It had been prescribed. There are a lot of different document types. There's a bill of lading document. 
it's different because there's folio management. It's not real-time approval by the, the SII. There are actually these folios with signature process um, involved in it. There's monthly reporting called Libros that are tied to the DTE activity, uh, which is key. And so it is a very complex environment. I hear all the time, oh, well, Chile is easy. It's not. It's not easy because of the folio management. It's not easy because of the tie of the reporting to it. It's not easy because Libros, you don't want to file any Libros report on transactions that have not been validated, that have not gotten the uh, accepted by the, the government. Again, there's no authorization code, but they do accept or reject um, information. And so it's, it's got a lot of different things and moving parts. And much like any other country that does the invoicing, once the supplier registers the invoice, the tax values are there. And so they're, they're checking on these things. This, this is what they're using against your VAT remittances, so it's important. And the one thing I will tell you that's overlooked in Chile is inbound, the accounts payable piece. Every other country starts with orders to cash, forcing that, and then turns on the accounts payable buyer validation. Because if you think about it, what happens is if I register $100 with $10 of tax and they make the buyer validate it, they want to ensure that the invoice the supplier sent to the government is the same invoice they sent to the buyer. And so this is coming in Chile. You actually have to test this, uh, the inbound DTE. Uh, you have to test this process already. And so this is coming as they start to roll it out. And they have some very interesting rules on the inbound accounts payable process when you talk about tax adjustment, credit note, debit note. So don't overlook inbound because even if you do the outbound process, inbound is definitely coming into play. Argentina, I won't spend too much time on it. They haven't changed much. We do expect some, some changes just based on some of the, the political issues that are, that are going on in Argentina today. But they continue to force organizations to eFactura. Uh, another 300,000 companies were mandated through August of this year. We expect them to announce another transition. It's primarily on the outbound side. You know, export invoices, business-to-business -business invoices. Yeah, I think the key thing here for companies to remember is that it can really affect your SAP development because of the way the billing document is handled. And so there are some unique things to Argentina that create some custom development for a lot of companies. Uh, Invoiceware eliminates that, but even though it's only the outbound process, there are a lot of complexities internally to the way that SAP handles billing and accounting documents. So let's get into the lessons. That's a lot of legislation, but let's get into the lessons. What, what happens because of this? Well, the first thing that I want to point out is most companies, whether it's through merger acquisition or local vendor analysis, have ended up with this architecture. And there's no one person that owns budget over this architecture. There's no one person that owns the project management over this architecture. It tends to be divvied out in multiple places. But when you start adding up the fact that Odds, you, odds are you have a Brazil solution, a Mexico solution that's different, an Argentina solution that's different, a Chile solution that's different. Now, if you're in Ecuador, an Ecuador solution is different. You have different local solutions for capabilities because you don't see the majority of the Brazilian players move into Mexico, Argentina, Chile. Invoiceware is different. We support all of these countries on the same platform. But often you have different solutions here. You then have a middleware issue and a middleware team that has to figure out how to extract data out of SAP, get it into the specific format, deal with the process type issues, deal with printing and PDF and customer distribution. There's a lot of process work now multiplied by four because each one of these is a different system. Who is maintaining and dealing with that cost structure? And then if you have a global template or even a regional template of SAP, there's always the update of the system. Version 3.1 in Brazil requires updates and upgrades to SAP unless you're an invoiceware customer, where we absorb these. And so who has the SAP upgrade cost for four different countries? Who has the extraction uh, development for SD and FICO? Who has the middleware components? And when something breaks, who do you call? Is it a local team? Do you have centralized middleware? Is it BPO'd? Is it the SAP Center of Excellence? You know, we have organizations when an invoice didn't show up at a printer, first they'd call the SAP team, then they'd call their middleware team, then they'd call the local invoicing systems integrator that got this box integrated, then they call the provider. Well, the truck sat there. And more importantly, there's not a single monitor. Even SAP solution, again, in, in Brazil, GRC, only supports Brazil, right? And you have blind spots. 
It could be broken in GRC, broken in PI, broken in SAP. So there's multiple monitors. This architecture is expensive. Uh, but the problem I think companies have is they don't look at the total cost of all of these components as an organization because they're divvied up, they're split up between different business units. And the long-term issues are constant, constant support call issues, constant change management issues, because the one thing that I've learned over the past seven years in Latin America is e-invoicing is constantly changing. So if you have this infrastructure, which most companies have, it is expensive. Number two, and this is the most overlooked, when you look at the government requirements, ERP configuration affects compliance, data extract issues. Right? There's always government connectivity, and people always look at this as the primary problem. It's happening in Chile. It's like, oh, well, I can just send DTE. I need a web service provider. No, because you can't do this government connectivity unless you do all of this other stuff, all of this process requirement, all of this ERP foundational work in order to get the data out to the government properly. And so often there's multiple sources. There's data that's not inside of SAP. It's not managed well, like Pedimento, import numbers in Mexico, FCI, import requirements in Brazil, uh, customs broker type information for what they call Entrada Nota Fiscal. So there's often multiple sources. Maybe you do hazardous material, have special ingredients, um, like some of our customers do multiple sources. How do you deal with the IDOC generation? Because there's complex logic. If you've done pricing conditions in a certain way, uh, cross-reference issue, you have Z programs, um, you have industry-specific requirements. Dino Nobel does explosives. They have certain information that has to go on the invoice. It's not stored in SAP. This extract is the biggest issue. And so, and it happens in every country. In Mexico, because of the weaknesses or the, the limitations of the XML, you know, for example, uh, there's only one, one line item for, for discount. And so if you have pricing conditions like this one customer at the line item level, you know, how do you deal with all those variations? How do you deal with the percent or flat rate? And then the PDF requirements can often be different. Customers can have an XML requirement addenda and then a PDF requirement. Surcharges, no field in the Copervante. How do you deal with that? Often the XML requirements and PDF are different. Dealing with distribution rules, where do things need to get printed? You know, most people don't think about this. This one company has 70 distribution rules based on master data and issues. Um, simple things like banking reference information added to the PDF. Unit of measure transformations. This is the difficulty. How do I get my SAP configuration, my version of SAP, into the rigid changing government XML? This is something that Invoiceware manages within our solution, and it's the same in every country. If you look at Brazil, you'll see some commonalities, detailed logistics information they want on with the Nota Fiscal. On Fabia is uh, industrial manufacturing, more of an automotive type uh, requirement addendum. MP135, you know, we had a customer that was not able to do this because of their current support package. We have customers that deal with that import information, you know, and how does that go from an external system on to the Nota Fiscal. Bundled data, secret functions or custom functions you have to deal with, missing localization. Every company that I speak with has this problem. And what happens is you, you purchase one of these local eFactura Nota Fiscal solutions, and that's the easy part. It's getting your data maintained and getting into the system is the difficult part. So this is 80% of the cost to implement, 80% of the cost to maintain, and more importantly, 80% of the cost to support. Now, when we talk about support, you know, that's the issue. I've talked to a lot of companies that will roll out SAP, they've gone through Latin America, and then all of a sudden now, what happens when something doesn't work? Remember, this is a real-time environment in many of these countries. Uh, and often, you know, who are you calling? Is it the ERP provider? You know, what support do they provide? Do you have a middleware team? Did you hire a systems integrator to build you uh, an extractor out of SAP into a local Brazil solution like a master SAS? Or did you hire a systems integrator to export out a CFDI in Mexico to provide it to a local PAC? And do they bring anything back in? And so if it's a government issue, if it's a middleware issue, if it's an SAP issue, who are you calling? Where do you see all this information from a single point perspective? And when the truck is waiting in many of these countries, what's going on? Yeah, same thing happens on the inbound perspective. In Brazil, for example, because a note of fiscal equals a truck, in manufacturing, 
you have a lot of manufacturers that do what's called gating, which means they won't let the truck through their gate until they have a commercially matched and viable nota fiscale. They know it's correct because they don't want to absorb the tax obligation and issues of incorrect NFE. You know, other companies will actually park the truck on a different part of the warehouse, but they won't move it into the production line until the NFE is done. This is operational type issues, not just e-invoicing. Lesson four, change management. Everyone will talk about, oh, we got it implemented. Well, great. What are you doing for December with 3.1? What are you going to do with eSocial? What are you doing with the new um, ECF report in January for Brazil or the new Mexico reports in, in January? And how are those going to affect accounts payables? Again, the government signature is not the issue. It's not just the web service connection. The issue is how have you configured SAP? You know, we have companies that only do upgrades once a year from an OSS note perspective. Now, they have some accelerated pathways to do things quarterly, but that's not easy. We have companies that have different versioning between their test QA and their productive systems of SAP. We have customers that have three different instances of SAP, all configured differently for different business units. This is the issue, the extraction, the updates, the components, the um, process of printing the PDF, signing, dealing with the printers, uh, the output of addenda, et cetera. This is where the change management occurs, not the local vendor. Because if you look at this, it's just like the, the other slide, multiple local vendors, the government signature process, middleware processes, things like transformation, PDF, distribution, SAP config. This is the problem. Number five, and this is actually often overlooked, and it really is a common problem. I had a discussion with a Fortune 10 company yesterday that, that had this problem uh, and didn't recognize it as an issue. SAP is not the system of record. You spend millions to consolidate on SAP or to roll out SAP through Latin America, and you train your users. And what happens is you have these local e-invoicing providers in Brazil or Mexico, and data is extracted from SAP, but typically it's never returned back into SAP, signing attributes, et cetera. This one Fortune 10 company told me in Mexico, they send the invoice to the Mexico PAC, their partner, they never return any information. And legitimately, they have a different billing document they send to their customer. And so the XML that will be used in audit, not the paper or other documents, what's in the XML in Mexico, doesn't match what's in the ERP system. In Brazil, because of master data issues and other environments, invoices are put into a third-party system, a third-party re reporting tool, and data is often manipulated in these tools. Never updated again in SAP which is what's rolling up into your books, into your uh, fiscal re reporting to your, uh, for those that are publicly exchanged, for example, on the stock exchange, data is different. Uh, it's just very, very common to happen. And now the invoice document for all of your purchases and all of your sales is in this local third-party box, and it's not under the governance of what you did in SAP. Things are changed outside of SAP. Why did you implement SAP? I mean, for governance, for visibility, for control, for ease of rolling up the books off of multiple countries. Support perspective. And this is a huge financial issue. When you look at Brazil, for example, and you look at Mexico starting to find, you know, the non-compliance can mean 75 to 225% of the incorrect tax value in Brazil. It's huge. I had one organization that was doing $50 million a year in Brazil, and they got fined $7 million based on incorrect VAT remittances. Uh, and as I said, the government is continuing to increase. Uh, this was a report here. Now, again, Mexico is increasing this. I think the report that they're coming out with in January is designed to help increase that and make that easier to collect money. The one that's often overlooked is the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. And so everyone knows typically about the Walmart bribery issues that, that happened in, in Mexico. But the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act is not just about bribery, it's about accounting provisions and being able to prove that you have the necessary tracking, auditability, and controls in place not to have issues get reported into your public numbers. Uh, and so Tyson, as an example, here's the link to the SEC press release, had a local Mexico box. Right? And, and often people say, well, there's no issue, we'll just utilize a local Mexico solution. Well, unfortunately, they created some invoice in, in here. Uh, filed them, that got pushed in back into the SAP system in public numbers. It was over a $5 million fine by the SEC. 
Uh, Crocs had a similar type issue. Cisco has some issues in Brazil in the billions of dollars over this. And so when SAP is not your system of record because your invoicing solution has manipulation, changes the data, is not consistent with your, your SAP system, what's the use of spending all of that money if all you've done is open yourself up to risk, risk locally and risk corporately? I think it's a huge issue for people that are consolidating the SAP system that is coming into fruition as these companies start to countries start to find and find more. And Mexico again with the report, but with Brazil's economy and some of the things going on there, you know, where will the Brazilian government go uh, to get revenue if they have any types of issues? It's going to be back after the corporate. So invoiceware takes a different approach. If you think about Latin America, it's constantly uh, a set of changing puzzle pieces, whether it's ERP configurations, new legislation, data extract. We deliver all of this. We're one provider for multiple countries, day-to-day -day support again. We eliminate the upgrades and patches so that constant change in Latin America doesn't affect your global rollout of SAP or your template. It's fixed price and the changes are included. And so, for example, our customers in Brazil are not paying additional statements of work to upgrade to 3.1. That is part of our, our service to them. What it looks like, even though there's a lot of complexity underneath the covers here, this is an example of an outbound sending monitor in Brazil. We have you know, a filter component. Again, this the value of this is it's managed by your SAP governance, managed by your SAP user, user authentication. All of the rules you put in place affect and control the ability to do electronic invoicing. You have an easy red, yellow, green light. Red meaning something aired out. Yellow is in process. Green means it's good. Down below, uh, you have all the auditability. And so the end user spends all of their time, whether they have to cancel a document, reprocess a document, they want to access the PDF or XML. The audit log is all brought back into SAP. The authorization codes are brought back into SAP. And so this has value that your user stays inside of SAP, they don't have to go to other places. And this has value that it's managed under your SAP authentication and governance that you put a lot of time and money into. Uh, it has value that if you're ever audited, you can pull up the information inside of SAP, all the signing attributes and authorization codes are there. And under the covers, it has value because it's absorbing the changes, the delta of new requirements versus your corporate system so that you're not constantly having to update SAP based on country changes. On the inbound side, same, same thing. We have inbound solutions, what we call Miro Amigo, because there's what you have to do, which is, tends to be outbound. There's what you can do on the inbound on top of what the government says. And so if you look at inbound processing, accounts payable, procure to pay, whatever you want to call it, this OK to deduct process, you see for this line item, this invoice, you'll see this green box and Safaz. This is the collect validate and archive. We parsed out the XML. There's access to the PDF and XML out of the monitor. You have to do that by law for all uh, inbound vector in Mexico. It's moving that way in Chile and definitely in Brazil. Now there's what you can do with it, which is what I call the OK to pay. You can match against the purchase order pedido here. You can do a two-way match. You can automatically utilize the PDF on the truck to drive your inbound receiving. So you can trigger your MIGO automatically. And you can do this three-way match even before the truck arrives in many cases. And once the truck arrives, scan the document, trigger your MIGO transaction in SAP, and then you can post the accounting books, your Miro, release that. It's all consolidated here. This is huge value to organizations that are manufacturing in Brazil. And again, it's because of what the government has forced all of your vendors and suppliers to do. You can utilize that to really simplify your inbound receiving and accounts payable process in these countries. And we support this again in, in Brazil. We've added it now to Mexico. We're adding other countries as well. So summary of our differences, invoiceware, multiple countries on one platform, reducing dependency on internal resources, that SAP hybrid cloud, avoiding uh, having to deal with specific op-op development and upgrades and OSS notes, we absorb that in our SAP solutions. Simplified architecture, not having four solutions, different middleware integrations, different SAP upgrade projects. Production support, one team for the end-to-end -end process. 
call us in your local language, Spanish, Portuguese, English, and then change management. These are the five values of, of what we bring. And so with that, uh, I, I'd like to, to end the session today. Uh, feel free to subscribe to our, our blog, Invoiceware INT, if you click this link. Uh, question that always comes up. I will make the presentation available. But if you have specific needs around 3.1, around Chile, some of these upcoming legislations, by all means, email me, steve.sprague at invoicewareint.com. Uh, along with my architects, I'm happy to, to set up a session. We can also utilize our local staff in these countries for local language uh, type discussions. But there's a lot of cost that can be taken out uh, of a Latin American organization running SAP on both the accounts payable and orders to cash side. There's a lot of risk that can be taken out uh, that's often overlooked. Uh, and if the CFOs and the finance teams truly understood what was having to happen uh, in some of these local invoicing and reporting solutions, I, I think they would be shocked. Um, but there's a lot of value to it. And so look at the total cost of ownership across Latin America. Look at the middleware costs. Look at the SAP update costs. Look at the support costs of that, the change management costs uh, as well, because there's a lot of things that can happen there. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over and see if there are any questions for today. Again, within your monitor and your council, feel free to enter those. I'll hold on here for a minute or two. But again, uh, I will make the presentation available for those those here. So the, the question is on Ecuador for, from our components. And it really, so there's different mandates out there. Um, we're looking at the end of this year from an Ecuador perspective to, to build it out from a, an SAP perspective. Uh, we are in beta development with a number of uh, a number of organizations, and so it will be GA uh, towards the end of this year. Uh, if uh, you are interested in Ecuador, I can set you up with the teams here to discuss the solution requirements. Not every company is forced in Ecuador. They started out with banking and finance. They're moving to what they would call exporters, uh, but we do have customers that are actively implementing Ecuador right now. Other questions? Okay. Well, I really appreciate everyone's time today. I hope it was valuable. I know it's a lot of information, um, but I'll get you the presentation. But I really appreciate you spending the opportunity um, to learn about Latin America e invoicing. And again, if you have any questions, steve.sprague at invoicewareint uh, would love to talk to you uh, about how we're helping others and how we could potentially help you. Have a great rest of your afternoon or evening, wherever you are in the world, and look forward to speaking with you soon.